Yo, 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 guys, what is up? Welcome back to another episode of Marijuana SA Weekly. And today we are back with part two of last week's episode. We've never actually had a, a part two of a podcast. Uh, we left you guys yeah. on a massive cliffhanger. <laughs> um, and today we shall, we shall expose the, the, the second part. Um, hopefully you guys were, were chilling and in suspense and you all managed to like and subscribe the, to the videos, uh, to the channel but between then. Um, because we thought that was, um, some really cool content last week. I mean, Dean, we were saying it's like probably some of our best, uh, that we, yeah, had. I think this new direction is, is, well, the, the direction is great. I think there's, I learned a load and, you know, mm -hmm. I think that it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's highly, highly valuable content. If I do say so myself. So <laughs> yeah, it's I know. like we're in really school think... again, <laughs> like the, yeah, I know, the exactly. learning like every week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Learning every week to bring better content and, uh, you know, I think I think uh, this is one of the points that's probably most questioned in mm. in the grow support line of work that that we do. So yeah, I really think there's some some great learnings to be had, and uh, I'm dying to know of all the methods that Mike's come up with to defeat these enemies. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we didn't even let you guys know what's happening. Um, for those that are just out of the blue watching here, uh, check out part one. It'll make uh, part, part two a little a lot easier. Uh, but part one, we did a bit of educational insights on like what pests are going to ruin your life when you're growing cannabis. And now we're going to do like how to get revenge against them and basically like ter terminate them. <laughs> you know, we're, we're doing pest slaying today. Um, uh, some different methods. I saw there's like the, you know, CO2 suffocations and there's obviously going to be beneficial microbes and like beneficial pests and things like that. So anyway, but we're, uh, we, we're going to leave Mike to explain all of those. Okay. I'm going to bring him in. Yeah, I'm just here to, yeah. I'm here to yeah. listen and Mike's here to show us the way. <laughs> exactly. Uh, last week was really, really positive. The feedback, uh, I've told the guys if they, if they just jumping in here, make sure to go check out part one It's going to make a, a lot more sense. Um, if they just get that initial, initial intro into the different types of pests. And of course, uh, for our international guys, you do have the, some of the same pests, but this is, this is a lot of South African pests. I think there's some gnarly things overseas that, that uh, we can't even imagine um, in all sort of corners of the world. So this will probably have a bit of a South African impact, but you guys will find similarities between uh, all these uh, cannabis killing uh, bugs. Okay, so today yeah, we're going to follow up on the first part, which was how to identify some of the most common pests um, on cannabis. And today we're going to go through them again, but this time we're going to look at what method you can use to prevent or exterminate them if they ever um, show up in your, on your plants. Um, so integrated pest management. What is integrated pest management? Um, so it's fighting nature with nature in some aspects. Um, and IPMs are, um, it's a, it's a, a long-term long strategy um, that will prevent pests um, and issues by modifying your um, your cultural practices um, and adapting to to whatever shows up with what you have. Um, so the the four main category we have of IPM is biological, cultural, mechanical, and chemical. So the biological, as the name suggests, is the use of uh, natural predators from those pests um, and introducing them, letting them do their job. So fighting nature with nature. Um, the second one is cultural. Uh, so is changing your cultural practices, um, your irrigation, your water, you know, your, your um, standard operating procedure in your grow, um, etc. Uh, mechanical is what directly um, kills and controls the pest. Um, so uh, for example, the HEPA or UVC filter to prevent air pathogens. In our case, we more after insect uh, so, you know, all the sticky traps, um, etc. And then finally, the chemical. The chemical is obviously the use of pesticide, um, which is not something we ideally want to use. It's usually the last one. And if we do use this technique, we, we make sure we mitigate the effect on the beneficial insects, uh, the environment, the, the humans around, etc. Um, 
So all those four methods are the main ones that you would use to control pests. So now let's look at those and how we can apply them to what we know and encounter. Um, so spider mites, um, we're not going to go through much of the description of what they do because we've gone through that on the first video. So um, they've got a life cycle of 8 to 12 days at 30 degrees and 17 days at 20 degrees, meaning they from egg to adult. Um, and wow. you can see the difference uh, between 30 and 20 degrees. It's, I mean, it almost takes double the time um, when it's colder. So you can really see that spider mites, they enjoy the warmth. That's why you get um, a breakout so, often. You often notice a breakout like after a very hot day if you haven't been that attentive. Because yes. then all of a sudden, you know, a few hot days and all of a sudden they've spread all over the, over the grow space. It's crazy, yeah, yeah. As you say, they when it's hot, they reproduce incredibly quickly, and they just take over. Um, and you can see that picture on the on the right hand side um, of spider yeah. web completely covering the plant, and you can see all those spider mites hanging up to the top. Um, so yeah, eight to twelve days, it's quick. Um, and then they they have a lifespan of fourteen to 20, 28 days, which is also a long time when you think about it. Yeah. Um, so they, they, they come and uh, cause, the, the, the way they come onto your plant most often are um, through wind drifting or ballooning. I don't know if you, even, if you knew that, but uh, spiders are incredible pilots. Um, they travel through the air a lot, and the way they do that is they let out a, um, several strands of silk in the shape of a, of a sail, if you want, in a triangular shape, um, and they just let it go up into the wind and they catch the wind and then they just travel like that. They can, I mean, wow. they can cross oceans, not spider mites, but some spider can cross oceans like this. It's insane. Um, <laughs> so this is how they spread. And you can see on that picture again, that all of them are concentrated towards the top, just waiting for a breeze to catch them and send them to the next plant to colonize. Um, so they spread very quickly. Um, and if you're indoor and you have fans, <clears throat> they're gonna, it's gonna limit their movement to an extent, but it's also gonna help them spread. So now how to control them. So biologically uh, speaking, you can use uh, Prosimilis predatory mites. Those are the main predators. They'll happily go inside the web and, and hunt for them. Um, otherwise, ladybug, green lace wings, pirate bugs, um, even assassin bug, they'll hunt for them, but not, ex not exclusively, and they're not as efficient as the, as the Prosimilis mites. Um, and then otherwise we have uh, Bavaria bassiana or Metatarsium robertsi, uh, which was called Anisopliae until recently. Um, it's an ento entomopathogenic fungus that basically parasitizes the, the insect and feeds on its corpse, if you want. Um, so those are also very efficient oh. uh, and they can be sprayed. They're, they're spores. Um, you can purchase them from various companies. We sell them. Um, I know quite a few other companies sell them. And this, you just use it as a spray. And when it comes into contact with the insect, the fungus starts to grow on it. Um, it also can stay in the soil if the conditions are right. So it's a, it's a nice long-term um, um, prevention method. Culturally speaking, um, like we said, they love temperature, high temperature, so manage your temperature, make sure you're not bringing in pests um, through other, you know, if you go and walk in your garden or in someone else's garden, uh, make sure that you pay attention if they have infestation because you probably will carry them back to your home. Um, so just be aware of that and then sanitize. With COVID, it's a good theme. Um, <laughs> Mechanically speaking, um, you, you know, make sure you have filters in your ventilation that always just, pre if you're indoor, obviously, that will prevent them from coming in. Um, and other than that, you know, uh, um, in extreme cases, what you can do is you can suffocate them, um, a nice and horrible way to die for them, uh, with a CO2 flood. So if, you, if you're supplementing CO2, just close your room and... Um, and, and flood that room with CO2 for a while. Um, and if you're in a tent, uh, you don't supplement CO2, anything like this, you know, close your tent, uh, go buy uh, some, some dry ice and, and just, just pour it in the tent and, and let it sit for a while. Uh, that, will, that will sort them out. Okay, that's a cool the, one. Um, I mean, it's probably yeah, just a, outdoor, a discretionary, I suppose, be careful with, uh, if you are supplementing CO2, don't, don't put yourself in there as well. <laughs> 
<laughs> yes, very, yeah, very good point. Yeah, yeah. You don't wanna, you don't wanna end up the same as the spider mites. Yeah, um, yeah. So just be careful of that. Um, and if you're growing in your bedroom or anything like this, also just be aware that you're doing it and keep some windows open so you don't flood your room as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, that's a that's a good method. Outdoor is is gonna be very tricky to, uh, sorry, to to do that. Um, and then chemically speaking, there is quite a, a wide variety of, uh, of solution. Um, whoops, sorry, wide variety of solutions. So the wetting agent um, and EM5 that we sell will do very well. Wetting agent, uh, otherwise known as insecticidal, insecticidal, geez, that's a terrible name, pronunciation, soap. Um, and that will dry them up and exterminate them. The EM5 as well, which is something you can make at home, same as the wetting agent. Uh, the neem oil um, will work very well as well. And the erythritol, uh, it's a natural sweetener, alter- um, alternative sweetener. Um, and they have a very strong effect on, on spider mites. So that's something that is nice and cheap. You can find in supermarkets. And is that is like a... Well. A deterrent or a, like a, a, does it kill them? Um, I suppose it's, they so it's det- commonly used as a, as a sweetener. So normally people will buy it to replace sugar. No, I mean like the, 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 the bugs, do they, do they just oh. not like, they don't like go near it? Um, or does it actually have like a chemical effect with the bug and like the bug then dies from yes. some sugar? Yeah, sorry, or- you're right. Yeah. It, it has a chemical effect. I can't remember exactly how oh. it behaves in the, in the insect, but it's, <clears throat> It affects them greatly. Wow. It's uh, yeah, it's an insecticide against them. It it really, it's got a chemical um, aspect oh, to it. Yeah, interesting, um, interesting. Thanks. Yeah, Brilliant. very interesting. And they, they, they. Yeah, it's it's one of the cheapest methods probably to control them if you're just looking at cost. Um, mm. And then natural pyrethrin will work as well. Uh, make sure it's in there natural. Um, it's not my favorite. It's not my go-to. So I would recommend this one as a as a last resort um but yeah they they do work and obviously all the chemical um solution try and avoid them during late flowering because it can uh, leave residue in your in your flowers so yeah spider mites that's about that's about the gist of of them and what they do and how to get rid of them and prevent them um Mm. next one is thrips um, thrips, yeah, thrips are a, a bit harder to control. They have a, a life cycle of 19 days at 20 degrees. Um, as you can see on the picture, they've got instar, pre pupa, pupa adult. The adult will live from 30 to 45 days. That is a very, very long time. For, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, and they lay 150 to 300 eggs and they have wings. So they fly around, <laughs> they live a long time. They're, they're small, they're difficult to see. Yeah, they, they, I don't like them. Um, so just to, uh, I've added that picture again of the, of the trip damage compared to spider mites. So you can see spider mites is a, is a lot more uniform in a way and it's small, small dots. Whereas mm-hmm. the trip is, is more random. Um, it's got different shapes and it's a bit of those silvery bites that are not round or they're just strange shape. Um, so they, the adults are winged um, and they fly. So that makes them uh, very versatile at coming onto all your plants and they're attracted to flowers. Um, they one of their common name is Western flower strips. Um, so they, they often hang in flowers. So if you're using cover crops, um, make sure that you're checking if you're letting it flower because that could be a, a perfect source for them. And, um, and yeah, if you're in your garden, um, just, uh, just, just keep an eye on your flowers because that's where it'll come. Um, I've grown, um, I've grown, um, yeah, I can't remember the name, but I've grown a specific flower in my tent the one time and I just had a trip infestation and i shook those flower to see if they were there and they were everywhere in the flower so just be wow. aware of that um oh another thing i haven't specified is, is the the thrip life cycle i don't know if you noticed is in the foliage for half of the time and in the soil or the growing medium for the other half of the time so this is also why it's very difficult to eradicate because they are both in the soil and in your plants Wow, okay. And in addition to that, they lay their eggs inside the plant tissue. So the eggs are very difficult to, to hit with a spray or a chemical method. 
Yeah, so it's really one of those ones that you have baggers. to keep at it. It's like you can't just like give it one application. It's like constantly just like, even when you're like, yes. okay, it's all fine. It's just like, keep going. Another one, another one. And it's like, exactly. it feels a bit counterintuitive, yes. but you have to, you have to just uh, keep on with it. Uh, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. If, you you catch it on your, if you catch it on your moms, it becomes a nightmare as well, because then it's spreading out everywhere yeah. into all your clones, into all your new spaces. So yeah, it's a, <laughs> I've dealt with some thrip as well, and it's not fun. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, like Andrew was saying, it's, uh, it's important to keep hitting them. Uh, I'll just go back to the spider mites to show you again. The importance of that life cycle drawing is to show you how many days are between each cycle. Because now, let's say you're doing an IPM and you're spraying your, your, your spider mites once and you think, okay, that's going to sort them out. And you probably will sort out most of the living ones, but the ones that are in eggs are, might have escaped. Um, and then three and a half days later, boom, you have a whole new colony that is coming. So make sure that depending on which pest you're trying to, to go for, Look at the days between eggs and first instar and adjust your, your spraying with that. So, for example, with spider mites, I would spray and then two days later, I would spray again and two days later, I would spray again or three days, you know, in, in those mm. ranges. Um, same for the, the thrips. Look at those days and see how, how often you need to spray because you're going to want to take care of the whole population, the egg, the instar, the pupa, the adults, everything. Um, and you can miss them if you, if you don't... Um, if you don't reiterate your sprays. Um, okay, the biological control of uh, thrips, the nematodes, um, SF as in Steiner Nema Felthiae, um, you can find them at a, at a few distributors. Those will do really well against the soil portion of their life cycle. Um, so that's a, that's a great one. And then for the foliage and above growth, you can use predatory mites. Um, those usually work quite well. Um, and always the Bavaria bassiana and the Metatarsium robertsi, uh, the entomopathogenic fungus, that, that works very well um, against them. Culturally speaking, um, you know, have adequate ventilation to restrain their movement. So if you're indoor, have fans just so they can't move as easily because they're small, they fly, but a strong current of wind will definitely push them. Um, so if you, if you have good, adequate ventilation, they'll have a harder time moving and spreading and etc. Um, and then make sure you're not bringing pests in, um, like we said, as always, and avoid letting your cover crop flower if you do have cover crop or if you do have flower nearby, just keep an eye out. Um, and if you do have flower nearby that you do want to keep, you can, in, um, you can um, add them into your, into your sprays or your treatments and treat them as well. Um, mechanically speaking, yeah, you can use the blue and yellow sticky trap. Um, that will catch them and indicate their presence if they're here, but it's not a, it's not a long-term method. You know, you're not going to exterminate the population just purely by using those sticky traps, but they're good to have. And, and they're quite, always, they're quite cheap the as well. The... Yeah, they, they are. They're not that expensive, so they're worth using definitely. Um, yeah. Um, and, and also they're, they're a great indication. So even though they might, uh, not kill the population, they'll indicate, they'll show you that they're there so you can see them before it's too late. Mm. And then chemically speaking, um, the wetting agent and the EM5, um, work quite well, both separate or combined and the neem oil, um, also, um, does very well against them. Um, but like we said, the eggs are inside the tissue, so it's very difficult to, to nuke the eggs if you, if you ever try. And then some of them are in the soil, so they'll come back up on the foliage when they're done. Um, and then, yeah, also always all avoid the chemical aspects on the late flowering stage. So yeah, that's about it for thrips. Yes. Um, they're very annoying, so keep an eye out and try and, and catch them early. Yeah, keep keep vigilant. You don't want to let it get out of control. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay, then aphids. Uh, aphids, a little bit less troublesome, I would say, but still very annoying. They've got a seven, eight day life cycle in average, um, which is pretty quick. They, um, they also give birth to, they give live birth, wow. um, which is very annoying. They're, yeah. they're straight away ready to go and... and ready to eat. So their population grows quite quickly. Fast. Um, yeah, 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 definitely. <laughs> and the, the, the adults can have wings as well. So the adults have wings and will 
go and colonize other other plants. They're called fundatrix. And um, another way they often brought in on plants is through ants. So ants will farm them, um, bring them on the plant, nurture them, protect them, and feed on the um, on the sweet substance they produce from uh, feeding on the plant. So it's like a okay. beneficial relationship they have. Wow, that's help interesting. Us. Yeah, so watch out for ants yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, and and if you if you ever have ants and you're worried about this, um, you know the Bavaria bacilli and the metatosium do well against the ants. So that's something you can you can look into okay. if you want. Um, all right. So the biological way of controlling them, parasitic parasitic wasps um, are really good. And you can see I've added on the left top corner, I've added a picture and you can see what looks like aphids, mummified aphids. They look all crispy and dry and they've got an exit hole at the back. So what, it was so sucked this is out. What you, that, that's actually what you would find when a parasitic wasp has gone and parasitized them. They will lay their eggs inside of them and um, the larva will grow inside feeding on the aphids and then exit through that little hole that you can see. Yes. Oh, okay, so in wow. a way they've been sucked out by from the inside by the by the children of the parasitic parasitic wasp and oh. eventually exited and went looking for their own aphids. So that's but really I cool. So I suppose that yeah. would only be something you could find outdoors. You can't like purchase parasitic wasps, right? You can, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nowadays, you actually can purchase buy anything, them. Bro. Um, and <laughs> yeah, that's true. Nowadays, you can buy anything. So you are able to purchase them, and I've tried them indoor, and they work quite well. The one issue indoor is because of fans, um, a lot of them end up going through the blades and get killed by it. But okay, yeah. Um, I mean, it's it's it still works. I, I still had great results, and I could find those mummified aphids on my plant, which made me very mm -hmm. happy. Yes, um, yes. Yeah. And then other than the parasitic, parasitic wasp, the green lace wings, assassin bug, minute pirate bugs all work quite well and they hunt them. Um, they hunt them quite well. The Bavaria bassiana metatosium, as usual, works extremely well against them too. Um, and then culturally speaking, um, you know, the, the ventilation, as we said, just to restrain their movement because the adults are winged. Um, and you make sure you're not bringing them in, um, through clones or through your clothes, etc. Um, in the cultural, one thing I never added is you can always use, you know, um, resistant strain to some insect because some strain are more resistant to some insect than others. Um, yeah, so that would yeah. fall under there. Um, and then mechanically speaking, yellow and blue sticky traps as always, um, good filters on your ventilation if you're indoor. And and in in bad cases, the CO two flood, like we discussed with the spider mites, that works quite well. I didn't mention it for the thrips, which you can still use, but you're gonna struggle uh, hitting all the ones that are in the soil because, um, yeah, they they're gonna find some oxygen. Um, but yeah, that will that will help. And then squish what you can. They're quite big. They're quite easily easy to spot, and they're usually in big concentration, so you can. You can do some um, some pretty nasty damage just with your fingers, um, <laughs> and then if you if you wanna if you wanna uh, hit them with a chemical, the wetting agent is extremely good. I actually forgot to add a picture of um, of what they look like uh, 24 to 48 hours after being sprayed by a wetting agent. But you can see they look completely dried out. They're all dead. Okay, great. So wow. wetting agent for aphids works extremely well. Yeah. Um, EM5 and neem oil, um, also fantastic and garlic sprays, um, tends to prevent them and uh, discourage them from coming onto your leaf just due to, to the nasty smell and taste, etc. Um, yeah. so that's something you can do. And then always not during the late flowering stage. Um, yeah. although the wetting agent, I mean, I've used quite late in flowering, there's no smell, there's no, there's nothing bad. It breaks down very quickly. It's potassium. Um, so it's not a, it's not the end of the world. But anything with a aromatic compounds such as EM5 garlic or neem oil or garlic, I would be very careful in late flower. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> a different kind of aphids, the root aphids, um, ten times worse than normal aphids in my opinion. 
They have a life cycle of nine to ten days, approximately similar to the previous one, and a lifespan of about thirty days, which is also a long time. Um, and they they have a you can see on that picture on the at the bottom they have a dark brown with a bit of reddish coloration or dark blue with a bit of red. They they darker in color those aphids. Um, so that's one way you can identify them. They're walking around. Um, but they usually come from infected soils, uh, from infected clones, from your friends, etc., or whoever gives you things. They can come through soil, of course, as well. Um, um, yeah, the um, the biological ways of controlling them: uh, predatory nematode, the Steinonema felsiae. This is a very, very efficient uh, way of controlling them. I've I've gotten rid of them quite a few times. Um, purely with the nematodes. Um, so that's something you shouldn't, you should actually do this at least once a month or every two months uh, if you don't have any issue and definitely once a month if you have issue. It's a good pre prevention method of having those nematodes in your soil no matter if you have pests or not. Um, yes, okay. And yeah, Bavaria, Bassiana and Metatarsium as always. Um, so culturally speaking, yeah, you just have to make sure you don't bring them through clones or outside sources or soil or compost, etc. Um, it's quite difficult to find them in a soil if you're trying to scout. In a plant, it's a bit oh, easier because you can just dig, find roots and see if they're around there. But um, yeah, just keep an eye out. But you, you, can, you can get rid of them. It's not the end of the world if you have them. And then mechanically speaking, uh, blue and yellow sticky traps to indicate you of their presence and catch the one that are exiting the soil and trying to fly on your plants. Um, and as always, squish what you can because you'll often find them walking on the edges of the pot um, and you see a black dot walking around. Just take a look and if it is one of them, squish it. Yes. <laughs> um, chemically speaking, <laughs> chemically speaking, it's quite difficult to get to them because they're in the soil. So any chemical you add in there will affect all the other um, arthropods in the soil and the plants and the fungus and the bacteria etc so it's tricky uh, natural saponin uh, are known to work to an extent but then again remember that if you suffocate them through sap saponin you'll probably suffocate someone else that you didn't yeah. want to like a beneficial so I don't really recommend going the chemical uh, route in the soil but if you were to want to try saponin would be the way I would suggest um, but yeah the 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 predatory nematode work incredibly well. I would I would definitely do that. And the fungus gnats, um, lifespan of seven to fourteen days with a life cycle of twenty eight days. Um, it's quite a long life cycle, and it's not a very long lifespan. Um, but the 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 part of their life which really bothers us is the is the larva in the in is the larva stages where they're in the soil and feeding on organic matter and potentially your roots. Yes. Okay. Um, so, so that those are the one you you're gonna the only in, annoying thing when the flying ones is they'll come and land on your flowers if you and get stuck up there. Um, but as an adult, they don't really cause any any damage, serious damage. Um, the adults are wings, so be careful, and they love wet environment, wet soil. So. The wetter your soil, the more chances you'll have of having them. Um, to control them biologically with uh, predatory insects, the predatory nematodes works incredibly well for the, the larvae in the soil. Um, and Bacillus uh, thuringiensis uh, variant israelensis, israelensi. Um, there is different variants um, of of BT um, and you can find some that are for mosquitoes um, and some that are for fungus gnats and they vary in species so make sure you get the Israel and see um, and otherwise Bavaria Bassiana and Metatarsium also work quite well on them um, yeah the um, oops sorry there we go cultural um, so, like we said, they love wet environment and wet soil, so make sure you reduce your, your irrigation and increase dry down. That's going to help limit their numbers. And you can also improve the soil drainage if you're really struggling, so by adding perlite in your soil or, or, or 
and things like that. Because yeah, yeah, that's not good. Complicated. Um, and then um, have adequate ventilation to restrain their movements, even though they usually fly low to the soil. It's a bit tricky. Um, and make sure you're not bringing them in through other um, plants or soil or friends that come and visit and drop a little fungus net in your pot. Um, <laughs> you never know, they might have them in their grows everywhere. Yes, I've exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, yeah, mechanical ways, blue and yellow sticky traps work very well. And you can add Melissa essential oil onto the sticky trap that has a, a strong um, attraction. It, it attracts the fungus net uh, a lot more to the sticky trap. So if you can find those, uh, you can buy them on a few websites. Melissa oil uh, is not uncommon. So you can find that. And if you want to experiment with that, just drop a few drops of it on the sticky traps and watch them um, swarm and stick to it. And uh, yeah, make sure you have the filters in your ventilation as always. And another way that you can um, help reduce the number is covering the soil surface with dry diatomaceous earth. Um, diatomaceous earth is, for insects, is the equivalent of, of glass shards for us. Mm. So when they go through it, it, it cuts them, it dehydrates them, etc. But it has to be dry for it to work. So if you water your soil and your diatomaceous gets wet, it's not going to be useful anymore. It's going to add silica in your soil and your plant's going to be happy, but it's not going to have a strong effect against them. So make sure it's dry and reapply it um, over time. Okay, interesting. And the Connects. same as the yeah. root a yeah. Same as the root aphids, um, chemically speaking, it's difficult to, to nuke them because they're in the soil and you're going to hurt a lot of other good things. But natural saponins can work and can help suffocate them. Uh, but it's not very, not highly recommended again. So yeah, that's about it for the fungus net. And I think we've covered most of our insect for today. Um, if we haven't covered any insect that you would like to know more and that you feel like are very common, please let us know in the comments or anywhere else and we can definitely try and cover them on the next lesson. Um, yes. But a lot of those techniques that we've spoken about, as you see, are quite uh, broad spectrum. So they apply to several insects, like the Bavaria bassiana and the Metatarsium. They apply to almost all of them, and they will apply to caterpillars and other insects. Yeah, um, and also, so, and yeah, do a bit of. And yeah. also treating your grow space like a cleanly environment. You mm -hmm. know, if you're walking around in the garden or in long grass or somewhere, you're bound to pick something up on you. You know, yes. so if you're yeah. not treating your grow space like a clean environment, you're going to get issues, and then you're going to constantly be bringing more issues in. So once you've def yeah. you know, once once you've dealt with, the, it's easier to to maintain yourself being clean and and your grow space being clean than to deal with stuff that's gone into your soils and eating your roots, you know? <laughs> After yeah, exactly. And like, like you're saying, like IPM, the, the whole point of IPM is, is, is integrated pest management practices that you implement before there's the, even the appearance of mm. those pests. It's mm. prevention and keeping all, like you mentioned, the cleanliness, making sure you're not bringing pests in. It's all those steps that you can take before having to deal with an infestation. And when you have to deal with the infestation, all your solution are already in place and already going. So you can just increase them or vary them yes. and, and you'll sort it out. Yeah. Excellent. So uh, act Mike, better than react. Mike, that was uh, an absolute pleasure to, to, uh, to watch. I, I didn't say much, but I listened to every word and I was hanging on your sentences. Uh, that was okay. some really good content. Uh, thank you so much and uh, yeah uh, as Mike said if uh, leave some comments below if there's any pests that we didn't deal with and we'll 100% do a part uh, three down the line but but like like Mike was saying what I really liked is he there's lots of his products I'm not using it's products I haven't even heard of yet that he brought up mm -hmm. so I'm going to be mm -hmm. doing some research after after this podcast you know but I think uh, th there's lots of parallels between techniques that one can develop over time and an experienced grower or a skilled grower someone who gets good results uh, has a strategy in place you know once you've dealt with something once you never want to deal with it again so yeah. rather put in the small amount of effort it takes to avoid having it again 
rather than like maximum effort to defeat a spider mite infestation where your leaves can't even like come up straight it's just like that thing that <laughs> looks so rough <laughs> I die, dude. <laughs> it was just me <laughs> way too much. That's when you're like, yeah, yeah. I just, I had I to throw in the to towel. Wendy once, and it hit like it hit like 48 degrees Celsius on some days in this Wendy. And like the one day I w- went inside, and like every single main cola at the top just had like these webs coming down, and I was like, what on earth is that? And it was just like the mother of all spider mite infections. Like I, I ended the grow, and then like at the end where all the plants were hanging, I like went in and the, the hangers at the top, they'd all like migrated to the top. And I just had like millions of spider mites, you know? And once you've seen something like that, you're just like, oh my Traumatized. God, Traumatized. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> all right, guys, we, we won't keep you any longer. Thanks so much if you've made it right to the end. Uh, and then just leave a comment below thanking Mike for coming on and sharing that that info. I mean, I'm sure it'll it goes a long way. You know, everyone's sort of doing this for free. YouTube doesn't pay us um we just here to share some info with with you guys and we can't do it without you um and yeah guys till next week peace peace